Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. So we're gonna begin the machining on another part here for our hardtail vise. This is gonna be, this is the swivel base for the vise right here. This is the part that this body right here, which we previously machined, sits down on top of that and just allows it to swivel and rotate in whatever position you want. We've got the other hardtail here, so you can see this is what we're talking about. Very common feature in many bench vices. I'm sure you guys know all about that. So this is what I wanna work on now. This is gonna be a project that we'll do in the American Pacemaker lathe. Uh, very simple uh, facing operations on both sides with a, with a bore down through here. And I believe we'll be able to do this in, uh, in two setups. And what we will probably do is go ahead and set it up. <clears throat> There's the very bottom right there. All right, what we'll probably do is go ahead and set it up and chuck it on this side right here and go ahead and get this side faced. We'll go ahead and put our bore in there and that bore is actually for our swivel bolt. So this is the actual swivel bolt. So that'll be bored to where that goes through, it actually comes up <clears throat> through the other side here. So your swivel bolt's gonna go through there and it's just gonna keep the two pieces together. It acts just like a shoulder bolt there. So we'll have to bore that and then to be able to flip it around and actually get this side right here, <clears throat> it's gonna be a little trickier to chuck this because of the tapered edges right there. And my jaws aren't wide enough to flip them around and chuck all the way across here. And I can't open the jaws up on the chuck large enough uh, to hold that without it interfering with the swing. Uh, I don't have enough swing on the lathe to be able to open the chuck jaws all the way out and uh, chuck it on the outside. It'll just, it'll hit the carriage, so no can do. I plan on making a fixture for this. I have a big chunk of steel that after we face one side and get that counterboard done, we'll put that piece of steel in the lathe and go ahead and get it turned and faced probably machine a register so it'll just slip up in this bore. We'll have it drilled and tapped so that when, when we have that ready, we can slide it up on there. It'll butt up against this face right here. We can use a uh, stud and a flange nut to uh, hold it to the fixture plate, bolt it on there, and then we'll be able to face this back side off. So that's the game plan anyway. So we'll head over to the American Pacemaker, start getting this guy set up. Before I start flipping the jaws around, I thought I'd show you what I'm talking about. I've got the jaws opened up enough to where the entire swivel plate could push up in here against the face and tighten it up. But I do not have enough swing. If we bring the carriage all the way over here, then you look down here, that's what I'm talking about. We just don't have enough swing because our carriage is a little bit too tall. So we're exceeding the uh, the maximum diameter that we can swing with the jaws in this position. So they would have to be flipped around the other way, which I'm going to go ahead and do now so that we can chuck it up for the first stop. You guys remember this little tool that we made for getting the chuck jaws out? Come on. Makes it quick and easy. You always want to blow them out really good, get any chips that are stuck in the threads there. Same thing on the spindle there too. All right, we got them set to about 11 and a quarter, equally spaced. That should put us about where we need. All right, so let's get this guy in there. We're just gonna give the face of the jaws there a white, make sure there's no chips or dust settle on it. So we're gonna use the back face of our casting as our reference surface, meaning we're just gonna push it flat against the jaws and that's where it's gonna register at. We're not gonna worry about bumping the face around or anything. Get it in there. We want it flat against the jaws. We want it kind of in the center. Does that look like it's in the center? Can you tell? 
It looks pretty good to me. Make sure that it's pushed all the way back. I'm looking back here and it looks like all the jaws are, are touching. Just get it snugged up there. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and go in there with our, our copper pads uh, for a couple of reasons. I really don't want to mar up the, the surface in any way. I don't want the edge of the jaws or anything digging in there and creating marks. It is just um, uh, a surface that we just clean up and paint. So there's not gonna be machined, but I do want to protect that. The other reason is that whenever you're indicating parts like this, like cast is a really good example. When you need to move it around because we're gonna do some indicating, the copper really helps to be able to allow the part to slide around without digging into it and creating those marred up areas that the jaws might do by itself. So copper pads for us, just push it all the way against the face of the jaw there. Snug that up, we'll go 180. I put my face, my, my face, I put my hand here just to be sure that it doesn't tip and fall out of there when I loosen that up. Come on. Just trying to get it in the center. All right, I'm gonna do the same with the other two. That's looking pretty darn close already. We'll get an indicator in there. So what we're gonna do is, we'll go ahead and indicate this ID right here. Everything, it looks symmetrical. I mean, meaning the pattern that was used looks like it was created pretty centered. Everything seems pretty centered on itself. So what we'll do is indicate this hole here and get it averaged out in the middle. And then we might reach in here and inspect the inside of this dovetail area just to compare readings and see if it's all centered up there. Ultimately, we'd really want to be centered up on this area here since that's going to be the rotation. And since we got material to bore out of this, it doesn't matter if it's dead in the center. So we'll indicate there and it will do a comparative measurement there. And if we need to, we'll readjust it to this if it looks like it's real far out. We'll reach in here with our ID attachment. One of my favorite indicator attachments. So usually people ask, this is the stair at number 670B ID attachment. Bolts right onto your dial indicator. About 15, 20, okay, 10, 20. About 25 to 30 thou is what we're out right there. Let me get you guys a little closer of the indicating. All right, so since we're starting with our ID, <clears throat> We want to tighten our, tighten our, uh, I'm sorry, tighten our lows, loosen our highs. That's the one we tighten. So I want to make sure the jaws are tight. So I'm going to go over our low and just make sure that the, those jaws are snug. That one feels good. I'm going to go ahead and loosen that one a bit and come back around and tighten that low. That's going to be our low, our high. Okay. Loosen our high right there and tighten our low. You're just looking for the average. You just kind of want it in the middle. Doesn't matter what the indicator is reading, just go 180 out and just try to average it out. So that's a little bit lower right there. It is a cast surface, so it's not perfect and it's gonna bump around on you. Still a little bit high, still just a little bit low right there, all right. You can get this as close as you want to. Not too big of a deal when you're working with castings like this. You got a little room for error on this kind of stuff. All right, so that's about four to five, five to six. So that's pretty even there. We go to this jaw. I just say that's around zero. And then we go 180, that's around one, two. So that is pretty well in the center right there. That's looking pretty good. So I'm gonna remove this attachment 
and we'll reach in right here and then check this dovetail and see if it's running way out from that bore. All right, we got a different tip on here, a little bit wider radius on the end. And come on, Noga, work with me here. We're just gonna kind of reach in here. We're gonna be at an angle, so I wanna put some preload on this guy. It's not gonna be flat on there. It's gonna be rubbing the edge of that indicator tip, but I think it's gonna be fine for just a comparative measurement here. We'll start there on, on our about a zero right there. And see what we see. You got a you got a high spot there. So about 10, 15 difference there. That's on 15. Let's go 180. And okay, so yeah, you got quite a bit of difference right there. That went about to the 50. So about 35 thou difference. Okay. So I think I want to go ahead and adjust this so that we have our center of rotation in relation to this cast surface here. We've got plenty of material to remove from this bore, so that's going to be machines where we indicate this now. All right, so let me just do some adjustments here. That's our high right there, so snug that one up again. Come around here to our low. That's gonna be a low. Nope, that's the low. Let's go back here. So 20, 30, 35. Let's go ahead and get it adjusted a little bit more. About 25 or so. Around the 25 mark. All right, that's pretty good right there. I want to yep, tighten that one back up. That feels pretty good. Let's go back to this guy. That's about 10 to 12. All right, there's your low right there. So we'll tighten this one up again. Yep, that's good. So let's lo loosen the low. eight to 10, four to five to six, right in there. That is, that's gonna be close enough. We're gonna leave it right where it's at. So I'm gonna go around and just recheck the jaws. I wanna make sure all four of them are uh, properly torqued. That one was a little bit looser than the other ones. So we're gonna call that good. 25, yeah, just average, all right? And I'm sure there's, there's people watching here that don't agree with me using an indicator tip like that. They're gonna say, you ruin it. You have people that try to tell you, you there's no point in indicating a casting. And there's all kind of indicating ways, methods that you can use to get a casting in the center. I like using an indicator because it's a foolproof way to make sure that I'm in the center. I'm using that to make sure that I am in the middle, okay? And that tip, getting a little bit of wear on it from that, that doesn't bug me at all because this is an inexpensive um, tip that you can buy that if you wear that out, I have never in my career worn out one of these indicator tips from doing what I'm doing. Sure, you're gonna get some rub spots on there, but I don't even feel that on there. This is a nice hardened tip and it's a very inexpensive piece to replace if you damage that. So. Not going to bother me uh, indicating castings with my indicator tips. I thought that since we were just discussing indicating a casting, let's go ahead and show one other way that you can indicate a casting because I know people enjoy seeing this kind of stuff and people are here to learn. So this is a surface gauge right here. This is one of my bigger surface gauges. And this is a good example of another method that you can use to indicate a casting. All you need is a reference point, is all you need. It doesn't even have to be a pointer or a surface gauge. My dad used to like to use a tool bit. He would have, we always used a Armstrong tool, uh, tool holder that had, you know, held a three eighths or a half inch tool bit. And he would simply just use that tool in the tool post here. He didn't have cameras out here in the way. And he would just stick a tool bit in there and use that and he would, he would rotate this thing around with a tool in there and feel it bump it or push against it and he would adjust the chuck 
uh, accordingly just to try to even out the rub marks on the side of the tool, all right? This is the same kind of setup right here, except we're using this pointer there to come right up to that surface. And we'll just bring it in there to it just kind of barely touches it. Now you can hear it. Let me change that. Let me get in here a little closer with the mic. All right. You can hear that. So you can use that to indicate there as well. If you can get in there and see the difference in movement as you're rotating it, you can use that pointer right there to help indicate that part. You adjust your jaw so that you get the, the tip of that scriber uh, even on a complete rotation right there. You can do that on a surface like that. You can come around here and do it on the outside surface if you were trying to bump up a, you know, get a face bumped in there or even the outside surface if you wanted to, maybe you want to indicate these four lug areas out here on the casting, you can bring that surface gauge right up there to the surface and use that as a point of reference on how far away your, your workpiece is to the point of that surface gauge. All right, so I just wanted to show another way that you could indicate this if you didn't want to use your precision indicator, if you have a surface gauge or any kind of tool or something that you can just stick in there and, um, and rotate your part against so that you can get your comparative readings as it's moving. All right, we'll start with the face. I'm gonna use this CNMG 432 insert. Now I don't have any uh, carbide inserts that are designated just for cast iron machining. But I do have these Walter inserts right here. It's these guys. So it's going to be a grade WPP30G by Walter. But this is a, a roughing insert designed just for taking roughing passes. And it's actually rated on the package here for cast iron. And it gives you your surface speed there, uh, 580 to 1480. We're, we're obviously going to go lower than that. But anyway, we're going to give this insert a try with our tool and see how it does on cutting this cast iron. Let's get the pacemaker fired up and see how it looks spinning. That's one of those gears that's a little more noisy than I like. We'll go to that one right there. That looks pretty good to me. Yeah, I think we'll roll with it. It doesn't need to be bumped back. I'm looking back here behind the, the casting and all four of those uh, jaws look like they're touching. So you're gonna see a little bit of run out on the face right there, but we're just gonna face it clean and uh, get it cleaned up. So we don't have a whole lot of material to take off of this. We shouldn't be taking any more then let's say 50,000 off each surface right there, all right? We'll go ahead and, and calculate a rough RPM that maybe we can start spinning this up at. Over here on the side of the Miltronics, I got this really nice uh, decimal chart that I've had for years. I love this one because it's got your formulas down here at the bottom for uh, surface speed, RPM, inch per minute, feed per tooth, and inch per, inch per revolution. You have turning, milling, drilling, and tapping, okay? so. We want turning RPM, and it tells us to take your surface feet per minute, divided by your work diameter, multiply it by 3.82. I know you can't really see that that well, but let's go ahead and uh, let's try that. So the lowest surface speed on this for cast iron says 580. So what we're gonna do is take 580, and we're gonna divide it by 10. That's 10 inches, because that's the largest diameter that we're working with. So divided by your uh, work diameter, and then we're gonna multiply that by 3.82. 221, 222 RPM. That's about the low end of the range that they're recommended to run this insert. So maybe we'll shoot around the 200 to 220 range, see what we got on the pacemaker. Then we'll start with that and see if it works. Down here we got 203 and then we got 238. So I'm gonna pick the slowest of that on the, you know, slower than what we figured. So we'll go ahead and try the, see if we can get it in. Come on, there we go. We'll try the 203 RPM. Let's get moving on it. We'll touch this off. I got a dial indicator over here we'll use to uh, set our depth. And I do have the feed set at 10 thousandths per revolution.
I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with say 25 and see what it looks like. Curious to see if it's gonna burn up that insert. Okay, that sounded pretty good. Finish is nice on there. Let's take another cut. That was 25. Let's take another 20. See if it cleans it up. That looks nice. I'm just we're giving it a peek to see if we got any hollows in there. You guys see any? We want to clean up any spots that might be in it, but it's looking pretty good. I need to get over here and look. I see some right in there, right in here. See another one right there. I think I'm going to take another 10 thousandths just because I can see some minor spots right in there that it didn't quite clean up. It did, but I think I'd like to clean it up just a little bit more. So we ended up taking a total of 55 thou from touch off. And I am real happy with the way that surface looks. We got it cleaned up well. We still got some deburring to do, but I think we may do that with a hand tool and not try to get in there and actually make a machine cut. We just want to knock off that, that sharp burr that's rolled over on that inside. You can use a, an air grinder for that. But I think that the insert did a good job on that cast iron too. It actually pulled off a uh, really nice looking chip for cast iron. We got it in our slowest speed. I'm going to use this air grinder here to get in there and uh, deburr that inside. Nicely. We'll have to feather the edge. It's got a little burr rolled over. Let's get that inside there as well.
Feels good. Got some scotch right there. Just give that surface a polish that we faced off and remove any burr from the deburring off. That's nice. Okay, I got us a bar set up. We're gonna go in here and finish out this bore. So this is, this is the D1 size multi-fix that I use, the Peewee tools. And whenever you're dealing with these larger tool holders like that, and having to get things reduced down to these smaller tools, it can sometimes be a little challenge finding the things you need. I haven't used this size post enough to have everything that I need readily available to just quickly grab a tool and throw it in here and go with it. But this little system for this bar right here, this holder worked good with the V-block, split bushing, and then we got a nice um, three-quarter shank boring bar there. This is a carbide shank that should work pretty good with a, uh, I believe that was a, a CCMT, no, I'm sorry, that's a triangular tip. I can't remember what that one's called. But anyway, uh, there's, there's our drawing for our swivel plate right there. And then we have a bore there specced out at 1.377. So that's the number that I'm gonna shoot for on that. And this is the swivel bolt that actually comes in from the back side. So it just pivots on this journal right there is all it does. Just keeps it all in the center. So I'm gonna machine this guy myself. I'm gonna build a new one. And when I do, we'll probably turn this journal to 1.375. And just so we'll give about two thousandths on that bore right there. Just get a rough measurement about what it is out here. So we're looking at right at around 1.2 inches. So you can see we've got a good 175 to come out of that bore there. Touching the back. Start off with a 50 thousandths cut. That is a tapered bore. Go another 50. Still at about 1.2. <laughs> All right, we'll keep her going. Use our telescope gauge and micrometer to measure the bore. One point three four three is where we're at. So that should give us. 34 thou, I believe. I'll verify that with the calculator because I don't like doing that in my head, but we should have about 34. We'll go ahead and take that in one cut to uh, finish it out. Take half of that, 17.
So it looks like we overshot our mark by about six tenths. Not bad at all though. That's not a super tolerance that we gotta hit. So six tenths over our target, not too bad. Let's put us a small chamfer on that edge to break that sharpness off of it. And this side will be finished up. Okay, the, uh, it's trying to rub, so what I'm gonna do is just pick the tool up a little bit and lock it in. That should work right there. There we go. Just break that corner. Sometimes that's all you gotta do is just pick the tool up a little bit so it doesn't rub underneath the cutting edge. So that completes this side of our swivel base there. So what we'll do next, we're gonna remove it from the chuck and we're gonna make our fixture. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll turn a, a register on the fixture with this diameter boss on there so that we can just slip it up on there. It'll be in the center. We'll have it drilled in taps so that we can put a stud and a flange nut to tighten this down against the face of the mandrel. And that'll allow us to face the backside.